everyone, and welcome to the Fringe North podcast. My name is Caitlin Townsend, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the project coordinator for this year at Fringe North. And I have with me here today, Eli. Eli, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself to everyone and talk a little bit about your experience with Fringe? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Eli Chilton. Uh, I'm, uh, my pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm from, I hail from Moose Factory, Ontario, which is in uh, uh, the northern part near James Bay. Um, I'm a uh, uh, Mishkego Cree um, from, from the James Bay area. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so I, I work and live here with my family. And how I got involved with Nishin was uh, through, um, uh, what, what, her name escapes me now. Um, uh, she, anyways, I, I got involved with, uh, somebody asked me, I worked with her before, and she had asked me to, uh, to be involved with the project. And, um, and I, I, I graciously said yes, yes, and I, I got involved and yeah, I, had, I had some a video, pro, a couple of video projects already in the can. And uh, yeah, I just decided to take part. Sorry, I have to find the mute button. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your experience like with that project and, and how did you uh, decide what project to start creating for that? And, and what was that process like? Well, um, my, my situation is a little different um, and, and unique because I already had an existing video oh, nice. um, and it was actually quite old. It goes back to 2013. So, uh, and I think we worked to, worked on this project last summer, I believe, um, August, 2020. So the video was already seven years old and um, she, uh, they had, the, the, I think it was Adam and- Sarah? Sarah, yes, Sarah. Uh, Adam and Sarah. Uh, they had emailed me and I had worked with Sarah before and um, they asked me if I wanted to get involved with this project. and. My first thought was, oh no, I'm gonna to have to create a video because <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of um, equipment. Um, I have mm -hmm. you know a couple of cameras around the house, but I don't have any editing software. I don't have a you know I didn't have a laptop at the time and things like that. So I was like, how am I gonna do this? And how am I gonna create a piece of artwork with a video? And I don't have a lot of equipment. But then I remember that I had this this existing video. Um, already in the can so to speak mm -hmm. and I was like oh perfect and um I had uh I had created it with uh, a couple of other people um in 2013 so I as soon as I realized that I said yes I'll do it yeah and, and mm -hmm. I'll I, I'll send you this video and I thought it would be um easy peasy you know in, in that in that regard uh, but then, you know, I had homework, I had to do some artist statements, yeah. um, we had to do some um, translation, because there's um, uh, English to create uh, English to uh, First Nations language. So we had to do that, I had to do some um, sort of post scripting mm -hmm. for the video itself, and then plus a digital transfer, which took a little bit of uh, uh, wrangling, I guess, mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, that, in, that, in, that, in that sense. Uh, so yeah, that's, and so that's, that's how, um, that's how that happened, but the video itself is an interesting story as well. Yeah. Uh, so how did that come to be? And would you mind sharing a little bit about the story of, uh, the initial project? I guess it was eight years ago now, seven years prior to the project mission. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so what happened was, um, uh, I guess first a little background on me, I, I, I work for a, uh, I'm a radio DJ uh, producer, um, youth worker, and I, I, run, I help run a small little community radio station here in Moose Factory, and it's called um, uh, CJFI, the Island Youth Radio, and I'm a DJ and a producer for them. And uh, at the time, it's been eight years now since I've, I've started that job, and I just started my, the job at the station and the youth center because it's um, the radio stations inside a youth center mm -hmm. and it's uh, sort of run under the, uh, the umbrella of the youth center. So it's, a, so it's nice. part of youth programming. And I've been there maybe a month, 
maybe like a few weeks. And um, in those days, uh, not so much with the pandemic and everything, but uh, everything leading up to the pandemic, we we'd usually have sort of a revolving door of um, guest programmers that would that would travel through Moose Factory and then travel through our First Nation here, um, Moose Creek First Nation. And they would run a program um, for sometimes just a night or two, sometimes a week, sometimes 10 days, you know, depending on um, the type of programming they're doing, whether it's arts-based or athletic-based or, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, one day this uh, arts group uh, came through town. They're called Wapakoni Mobile. And they're based out of Montreal, I believe. And uh, they're um, uh, largely a francophone company, but mm -hmm. they're starting to, uh, they're, at that time, they were just starting to branch out into uh, the rest of Canada. So like uh, the Eastern provinces, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, as well as Ontario and Manitoba. And what they do was, uh, or is, what they do um, is uh, they have a, um, the sort of this traveling film production uh, unit. It's inside of a, an RV. So they have editing suites, they have um, state-of-the-art cameras, uh, lighting kits, uh, tripods, uh, everything. A everything you can basically do, uh, any kind of equipment you can have to do a, 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 um, a, a film or, or a video production. And what they do is they travel around um, to uh, small communities and First Nations communities. And they um, go in there and they sort of have this um, message of um, uh, self-esteem and uh, building your self-esteem and, and um, expressing yourself through art and video produc production and um, sort of gaining a, a positive perspective on yourself and things like that. And, but they, uh, and they also, uh, like I said, use video production and they go into this and they into a community and they say, well, okay, youth, you can, you know, join our, our program and we'll shoot a video or a film. And at the same time, you'll be learning about yourself and learning about self-esteem and things like that. It's really neat. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite impressive. And um, there was the, they, this group that came in, there was a, a team of two um uh this young man and and um uh, a, a young lady and they were doing a sort of recon mission what they were doing was sort of traveling around to different first nations in ontario and manitoba and they would just take a uh, sort of a miniaturized version of the rv so they had a couple of nice cameras a nice uh, editing kit you know with a laptop and things like that and they were going to do um, sort of a, a smaller version of uh, the, the program. So instead of over an eight day period is only over like a three or four day period. And then they, they'd get a good feeling for that community and then see if it's a, a viable um, entry point to mm -hmm. that community. And then they'd go on to the next one and then they'd map out, you know, what they were going to do later that summer or the following year, that kind of thing. So they're just uh, checking it out basically. <laughs> and um, uh, me being a big film buff and a cinephile and a, a theater geek and a writer and all that, I was fascinated by their, their program and I was fascinated by, by who they were, uh, who they are, I guess, and who they were at the time. And, you know, I got the talk shop, you know, and mm -hmm. with them and talked about movies and, you know, videography and stuff like that. And every day uh, I would go on the radio and do my job, but every day I'd go visit them. You know, say, hey, hi, you know, like, how are you guys doing? You know, did you guys do this? Or, did, or what are you doing today? And, you know, sort of chat because they would um, use the youth center as their mm -hmm. base of operation. So finally, um, they told me what that the, they were trying to get youth involved to create a couple of videos, uh, more specifically a postcard, to sort of take mm -hmm. home to their, um, their leadership base. Mm -hmm. so that they can all watch the videos and say okay we can go to Moose Factory we can go to uh, Wiki we can go to you know this town and, and based on their videos and, and the enthusiasm and, and the uh, participation uh, we can go to these X amount of communities and um, this is winter 2013 and um, 
they didn't have any interest. They didn't have any youth uh, come forward to, to get involved with them. And their deadline was coming up. Like they were leaving, I think on a Saturday and they talked to me on a Thursday. And they said, yeah, Eli, we don't have any youth coming forward to do this postcard. And we, we have to have a postcard to at least, you know, uh, to take back to, uh, to our home office. I was like, oh man, that's, uh, I'm sorry to hear. I said like, uh, you know, I wish I knew somebody like I could tell you about or something. And then, and then they suggested, well, how about you? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm, I'm not exactly a youth. I said, like, I was in my mid thirties at the time, you know? And I said, and I said, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They said, like, we, we, we see that you're, you're enthusiastic about the arts and about mm -hmm. videography and things like that. And, um, could you be our subject? Could you, could you sort of direct, you know, a piece for us and then we'll take it, you know, take it, take it off with us, take it with us and we'll give you a copy and everything. And I was like, um, if you're okay with it, sure. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So basically yeah. the opportunity just, you know, dropped in front of me. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember coming home that night to my wife and I said, oh, I got a, I got a directing gig. <laughs> it's like a directing gig what who where and I told the story you know so um I wrote a script that night uh, a short little uh like a two minute script it's like two pages written on legal pad and and then um, um we met the next day this is a uh, I think it was like 36 hours before they were gonna leave town mm -hmm. and um I said, yeah, I got have a script here. And they said, you wrote a script? And I was like, yeah, I, you know, it's kind of what I do. I said, I just, you know, I just wrote a script for us and this is what we could shoot. And I, and I kind of laid it out for them and, and um, how the piece would go. And, and it, it's pretty much translated from the script to what you see in the video, the, the Project Nishin News Factory postcard. It's, it's almost translated to, to a T. Uh, how it worked out except for a couple of things which are which is kind of a mystery of filmmaking you know like mm -hmm. um, happy accidents and whatnot yeah. mm -hmm. that's really exciting what was it like to have such a quick turn turn around for a project like within such a short time frame because you only had like a couple of days to jump in yeah it was um it was really exciting um it uh it, it wasn't uh, a shock to me uh because with um with radio uh we have i've had a lot of people um just you know uh give me a call or email me or just knock on the door and say he like could you do this mm -hmm. you know with the radio and i was sure you know like, uh, when do you need it oh, oh today or tomorrow or something mm -hmm. so uh, in that sense i wasn't taken aback um i was more taken aback sort of like by the um i don't know how to put it without being terribly dramatic the cosmic coincidence, I guess, I mm -hmm. guess I, you know how you put it, just how um, these, this company and the, uh, mind you, I must, I must mention too, that the company never came back. They, they never returned. So I guess um, because of lack of participation and things like that, mm -hmm. it wasn't a viable, you know, like um, investment for them, you know, to send all their resources and stuff up here and everything. So uh, in that sense, um, it kind of makes it even stranger because I just met them for six days, you know, eight years ago. And um, we worked together for, you know, 30 hours and, and did this short video, you know, and uh, it was really exciting. It felt good to, um, it felt good to direct. Mm -hmm. you know, it felt good to translate a script from page to screen. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was, it was really fast, but it's like these mini tries, little moments that um, a lot of professional filmmakers sort of have many years to ruminate on. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, we were editing, and uh, after we we got the footage, um, and I said, "How how, how about this? How about, how about we do this cut?" You know, I said to to. Uh, to the to the, the the lady i think her name is marie um and i said marie how about we try this cut and then she just looked at me and said no <laughs> and i was like 
Well, okay, I could either argue for my point or I could, you know, sort of just go with the flow or, you know, it, it, it happened mm -hmm. within like a few minutes. So I had this chance yeah. to sort of negotiate it. And I said, okay, you know, I just let it be, mm -hmm. you know, and we made her and I just trusted her as an editor and, and she just made the cuts and, and, you know, we moved on. So, you know, that was sort of like a very, very miniaturized version of say, you know, working on a, a high budget film or a television show and you're butting heads with your editor or your cinematographer or something like that, you know, and yeah, it was just a teeny tiny moment, but I still remember to this day, you know, like that's sort of the, yeah, that's things like that. Mm -hmm. So it, in those 30 hours, we had moments like that. Like, for example, um, uh, I asked politely, I said, can we go off our, um, uh, off our script? You know, can, can I get a couple of shots here? Because I was seeing opportunities around where we we're shooting and location. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, sure. Where, what do you want to do? And I said, well, can we get a shot of that? You know, and sure, uh, you can you can place the camera. So I said, okay. So I picked up the tripod and camera, looked through the viewfinder, you know, like I did a whole like framing, you know, of it. Mm -hmm. And and then we we shot it and it's in it's in the piece. So Awesome. Yeah, moments like that. So it's kind of giving myself permission and, you know, asking politely. It's only a three-person crew, but yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was really, really fun in that sense. Yeah. Um, so was this your first project that you ever directed or had you had a little bit of experience under your belt at that point? Well, uh, I, I, had, I had done videography work mm -hmm. in high school. We, had, we used to have a local television station here on the island. Nice. Uh, Wawate Communications, Wawate Television. They're mostly radio now, but I used to, I did co-op with them, and I, I used to volunteer for them. And um, so we we um, I used to do um, um, uh, videographer pieces for them, you know, mm -hmm. segments. So I used to edit, and this is all on 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 like uh, three quarter inch tape, you know, back in those days, yeah. right? So um, and I used to edit and host, and this is all in the mid nineties, you know? And after that I did, you know, like uh, video pieces with my friends and that kind of thing. And um, I went to theater school. So I, I did a little bit of directing for stage and, you know, like scene studies, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, but nothing on a professional level, like mm -hmm. nothing on, a, on a, that kind of scale, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it'd been a number of years, like since I actually like um, did any kind of like formal directing, I guess you can call mm -hmm. it like quote unquote formal directing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you find it very different like in the in the film sphere compared to like your directing experience with like on stage stuff? Um, no, actually, it, like when as soon as I started, as soon as we started doing it, um, like uh, getting the shots and 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 directing. Uh, the two sort of melded really quickly, you know, and I, it's, it's almost like I was um, shaking off the rust. Mm, yeah, you know, um, it's a great way to put I, it. Yeah, because I was I was directing. There's um, portrait shots in the middle of the postcard, where I sort of do these um, these. Uh, I don't know if you know the the film Samsara. Um, it's, I'm it's, not familiar uh, with it. Sorry. Yeah, it's a it's a documentary film. That came out in the um, mid two thousands, and uh, there's another film by the same filmmakers that was released in the nineties, and they do these very um, rhythmic, uh, sort of slow uh, uh, push in um, uh, portrait shots on film. Yeah, so I was directing those for the, for our students that we had because there's a youth conference happening at the very same time as when we're shooting um, the video. So those, those, they became my subjects. I asked them, you know, can yes. I can be in the video? And uh, you don't have to do any acting. All you have to do is stand there and just look at the camera, you know, just it's sort of, you know, stay focused. So I was, yeah, I was directing um, the shot, you know, like in a sense, I was saying, okay, we're gonna be going on, we're gonna be going in on three, two, one. I remember holding up my hand and say, okay, action. And then it was quiet, you know, and then 
you know, cut and, and you know, that sort of thing. So it was kind of exciting that way, but it also made me realize that I'm a little older now too. You know, I, I didn't feel the, the sort of the jitters, I guess, of, mm -hmm. of, of being in front of people or speaking to people, even mm -hmm. interacting with uh, the, the video crew. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's really exciting that the youth were able to get involved too and be a part of that. And even though none of them came forward to do a project on their own, they still got to be in one in, in a sense, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I was, I'm really thankful for them to, 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 to be willing to do that. It was, um, and some, some communities that, that are as small as ours and, and um, with First Nations communities, some people can be very shy. So mm. they, they did a great job. What was your favorite part of getting to create the project overall? Um, well, two things. First was the the ending. Um, it was a, just a beautiful, beautiful accident that happened. Um, I don't know if you've seen the video, but yeah, it's um, you have. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but if you so want to explain for viewers too, go ahead. Yeah. The, uh, well, the video itself, there's a. Um, it's very it's very quiet so there's not a lot of sound effects there's no there's no music um you hear a lot of like sort of ambient sound like wind and that kind of thing and they're basically just portrait shots of the community of moose factory so some major landmarks so you see the the local um uh, hotel eco lodge uh, a church uh um some uh i think um uh, the Moose Creek complex, which is where the, the local grocery store and our local First Nation are housed in there. And there's different landmarks, these physical landmarks. And then you see like, you know, a river, a moon, or, you know, and they're, they're sort of intercut with um, these students, these young people. Then at the very end, a spoiler alert, <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a shot of an elderly man walking down the road and he walks right up to the camera and he actually puts his he puts his face right to the lens and he says hi and then he, he ends up speaking to me and that was the morning we shot the sunrise it was supposed to be this I was hoping for this beautiful wintry sunrise where it's blue sky and you know and but it ended up being kind of overcast and we still got a decent shot of the sunrise um but uh, when that happened, it was another moment where we we're standing there and I was just sort of, we we're shooting the sun, the, we did a couple of uh, takes of the sunrise and I, I looked down the road and I saw somebody walking down the road. I said, oh, that looks like an elder. And then they turned the camera, you know, to look down the road and they started shooting it. And I, and I said, I think that might be Jack. I said, like, I, I kind of recognize the, the, the gate of the elder and then he walked again like i said he walked right up to the camera and i said and our, our dialogue is right there in, in the video I, mm -hmm. I said good morning i said how, how are you and he's like oh you know and he's talking away and he talked about the weather and you know really interacted with us you know like yeah, nicely and then he um i even sort of complimented him or um uh, about you know you're gonna be a movie star you know sort of just mm -hmm. being sort of um, complimentary and sociable, you know, but he kind of, uh, he just, he didn't um, go into that. He didn't really um, uh, pay attention to that. He just said, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, have a good morning, bye. And he, then he left, you know, yeah. and we're sort of, and then I kind of looked at my crew and they looked at me and like, that was cool. You know, that's <laughs> really neat. And, and then um, uh, Marie, the editor, she, she decided to put that shot in right at the end. Mm -hmm. and it, it sort of uh, ties the whole piece together and um, he's a, uh, a World War II vet and he passed away about three or four years after that like 20 I think it was 2017 or 18 he passed away so it was it was incredibly fortuitous mm -hmm. um, but it's also really touching to have yeah. that 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 footage of him. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is um, the uh, just working with the crew, like is really like fascinating because we spent it sort of the day together. You know, we spent like um, a day and a morning together, like editing the piece and 
it was like I said, it was just everything was just compressed, you know, like everything mm -hmm. you can you can experience in a in a in a shoot and in a production. It was just like miniaturized and compressed into a very short, short period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, everything from challenges to um, you know, easy, easy decisions to even even physical challenges. When we shot um there's a shot in there of, of the frozen river, and at the top of the frame, there's a plane that fly, flies through. And that day it was must have been minus 25 degrees Celsius when we shot it. And that they weren't dressed right, um, both the, the crew, uh, Marie and uh, the young man. Hmm. And their hands were starting to freeze. Oh no. Yeah. And, and she, she's, she's like, I, she was trying to do like the um, uh, uh, white balance, mm -hmm. you know, on the camera. And she's trying to, and her hands were, were starting to cramp up. And she's and she's like I can't press that. So the the young man worked on it, and he's she's like my hands are. You know, she's like I was getting worried. I was looking at her. I was like holy cow. I was dressed. You know, I knew exactly where we were, and I was, you know, I was just like I was overdressed. If anything, I had like ski pants. We didn't have a vehicle. We walked around town that day. We walked everywhere we went. I think we took a cab like once, and because um, I didn't have a vehicle, and I couldn't I couldn't get a vehicle at the time. And I gave her my mitts. Like I had these moose hide, you know, like these really big moose hide mitts. And I gave them to her. And she's like, oh no, you know, I can't take your mitts. I said, no, no, no. I said, like, I have this big coat here. And you know, my my glove, my uh, pockets are lined, you know, with like a fur and stuff. So no, no, you take those. I said, your, your hands are starting to get really cold. She's like, she's like, oh my goodness, it's really weird. Yeah. So yeah, even that, you know, like those sort of those those challenges when you're on set, you know. Like mm -hmm. when, you know, like a, a, you know, that you have to sort of figure out the moment. So yeah, that was that was a really good thing, and and I haven't experienced it since. Mm. You know, like having it was like so strangely coincidental. You know, where everything just fell into place. You know, at the it's awesome. you know, with, with a three little person crew and a camera and all that stuff. So I mean, yeah, that's it's uh, it's almost like the um, life was tapping me on the shoulder and say, hey, okay, um, don't worry. You know, nice. you'll, you'll get, you'll get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's really exciting. And yeah, it always feels good when things just like line up and happen naturally too. And um, it's, it's great to just enter into that and to be a part of the process rather than feeling like we have to make things happen, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like that end clip too at the end of the project because like just the it it happens so naturally and <laughs> just like the interaction but also like the the noise that it adds in terms of just like for me watching the project i really enjoyed just like that ambient noise sometimes we ignore it so much in our lives and yet like to appreciate it and and i don't know it just it it made me very reflective of like all the things that we we don't pay attention to in our day to day and that we just ignore uh, and how wonderful they really are. And I really liked the end piece because like as he's walking, you can hear like the snow crunching too before the conversation happens and just like the natural sounds like and then the car drives by too and you hear like the snow, like s driving on snow just sounds so different than <laughs> not driving oh, yeah. on snow. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> to be more specific, specific driving on that type of snow. It was like minus 20 degree sort of, you know, dry sort of, you know, like snow, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as many people know that the, the Inuit have like, like 40 something, you know, ways to say snow. So because mm -hmm. all the different types of snow there is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, we kind of captured something there. Definitely like in that sense with the ambient sound and that ambient sound too is um, that's all natural. Like when you're here, you know, up here in Moose Factory, and there are a lot of communities in Northern Ontario that have that thing, whether it's a, a place like Cochrane or a place like um, uh, Moose Factory, uh, it is quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like you might have it here, a snowmobile or a, a siren or, or, uh, or something, you know, like, but it is fairly quiet, you know, like, uh, uh, and that all that was captured, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the moment. You know? Yeah. So for viewers, if you haven't seen the actual project, you can go on to our YouTube and it's there. Uh, take a look at it. It's really cool and fun to watch. So I suggest you you look into that. Yeah. Um, so you had also talked about having written the script for it and kind of it being like an overnight thing that happened really quick too, right? Has 
all that condensed mm -hmm. piece. So um, was it this the first thing that you've written or have you had writing experience prior to that as well or? I, um, I've been writing a long time. Um, I, 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 I was one of those kids that, that, that wrote scripts, you know, on the side, you know, I, I, and when, in, when they were kids, um, I was writing scripts in elementary school. Uh, I was writing scripts in um, high school, along with poetry and, you know, short stories, that kind of thing, or any kind of um, sort of journalistic uh, pieces that that might have been asked of me mm -hmm. uh, when I was younger but it's, writing scripts has always sort of been there like it's, it's ever since I was a child and um, and then in when I went to college uh, I got into well I, I hadn't written much for this for the stage I'd written scenes and things like that but I ended up uh, going to theater school and I wrote a couple of plays, a few plays, especially um, there was one play that was a two act play and it was um, uh, sort of like a year end project kind of thing. So that was my first major, I guess, um, success, you know, and creatively uh, for writing for this, for the stage. And, um, and then I, I was trying to do, you know, some videos and things like that when I was in my late teens, uh, which meant you know, writing a script for it, you know, and um, I, we, we tried getting into film production, feature film productions in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. So I ended up writing a feature around that time. So it's all kind of, like I said, by the time I did the video, it was like, it was like second nature. Mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was yeah. just, you know, it was easy, you know, it was mm -hmm. really, really easy. In fact, it was so easy that I knew, um, the the parameters you know were, were simple you know like I, I didn't have to convince myself to um be less ambitious or mm -hmm. to um oh i can't do that there's no money you know like uh, how, how can i do that well, we need actors or you know I, I wasn't getting fanciful or 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 sort of um unrealistic as, as far as the the parameters of the video were um, I knew exactly what the parameters were. I knew exactly what we needed. I knew exactly what was um, um, realistically what was to be expected from from the shoot to be um, illustrated for 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 Wap Wapakoni and what they needed. So it was um, uh, hence the the sort of the portrait portraiture shots of the community. Mm -hmm. That was the simplest thing that we could get without trying to ask a couple of young people to act something out when mm -hmm. they don't have an experience to act or anything like that. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah, that, I'd been right a long time with up, up to that point. Yeah. And what is like your favorite, um, I guess, method to writing, or do you have like a different process? Cause I know some individuals, especially when you're writing for film has compared to like stage, they can take a different approach or, or where do you start when you first decide to get into a writing project? Um, the, the, um, yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting question. Um, because they're, the, the format, as you know, is, is, are, is very different between, um, a stage play and a screenplay. Um, and that's one of the big things that they, they teach you when you first learn screenwriting, you learn the format, learn the format. Because uh, if the form, if it's not properly formatted, you know whoever's reading your script won't even take a second look at it if it's yeah. not formatted properly. So that was one of the first things um, I learned, apart from you know three act structure and you know that sort of thing, plot point one, plot point two, midpoint, you know all that, all that stuff, you know like um, along with character development, all that. Uh, the I guess the the big thing that that I start with is the premise, um, the, 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 the idea, the original idea of the piece. Um, I have to have a good premise, you know, to start. Um, it's, as, as you know, it's, it's really difficult to invent sort of out of thin air, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, to sort of brainstorm an idea, especially if you have partners, it can be really, really challenging because 
you're starting with nothing and you have an infinite amount of possibilities <laughs> and combinations to try to choose from. So you're, so you're going back and forth. And, and this is sort of alludes to the idea that I, I did have writing partners in the early days of, of, of my writing. Um, back in the, in the mid nineties, when I was late teen, I did have a, a, a couple of writing partners. Uh, so we'd sit there and, okay, you know, what's this gonna be about? Uh, okay, uh, what do you like? What, what do you wanna talk about? You know, so mm -hmm. we'd sort of talk about current affairs and, you know, drinking too much coffee and getting all excited and all that stuff. So, uh, so when you once you whittle it down to a premise that you that's sort of um, that's uh, workable, I guess, malleable to, to sort of start um, uh, start doing all the techniques that you've learned in how mm -hmm. to write a write a stage play or a screenplay, then you can start doing those things like looking for the midpoint, looking for the plot point one you know looking for your hook you know all that stuff you know or or um, in, in the case of a screen a stage play you're thinking about your stage you're thinking about your setting you're thinking about your you know stage right stage left you know like downstairs mm -hmm. you know all that stuff you know like your stage directions and uh so um but yeah and for example if you think about um i'll just say i'll just kind of give a pop culture reference here um think about something like big lebowski you know it's um the big Lebowski is looking for his rug, you know, and he goes through the sort of criminal underworld of Los Angeles in order to eventually try to get his rug back, right? So it's it's a beautiful premise. It's simple. So I'm trying to come up with different things like that, and it's it's it and it can be very much a eureka moment once mm. you find that premise. It's it just hits like a bolt of lightning, you know, and uh, it's really exciting. It's almost more exciting than writing the piece itself. <laughs> trying, trying to find that, trying to come up with that, that premise because it, it can be gold. It can really be a through line, like a spine for the mm -hmm. whole thing. You have to kind of come back to it all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you're going through that writing process, for you, when do you know that you've hit that that eureka moment and that that lightning bolt has hit versus? Um, maybe this is an idea that still needs work before we get quite to that lightning bolt moment. Uh, for you, how do you recognize that in your writing process? Oh, it, um, uh, it is a bolt of lightning. Like it, it's really exciting because mm -hmm. when you get the idea, all things flow, mm -hmm. all yeah. things flow. It, it, it just makes things easier, you know, like mm -hmm. the characterizations dialogue um all those points that you try to hit you know in, in a, a, a three-act structure mm -hmm. um even with the stage you know like with um trying to uh write for your setting and, and sort of the static you know theatrical manner you know um when you're when you're presenting a stage play it, it just flows like it just it's it, it's it's <laughs> It's hard to it's kind of explain, but I can tell you a story. Um, when I, my first big play that I wrote after college, because I left college in, in 99, and um, I didn't write a, a, a full script for a long time, say almost 10 years. Um, but I'd written poetry. I wrote two books of poetry in that, in that time. So, um, and wrote, wrote a couple of smaller things, but nothing, nothing to that, that level. But I wrote my first play in 2009 and it was called A Sandcastle. And the, I decided that I wanted to write a play um, about First Nations people, about my people, about where I come from and you know, who I am as a First Nations person. I hadn't been doing that really up until that point. A lot of my work, um, a lot of the scripts and stories that I've told. Um, if you had asked me at the time, like in the late 90s, early 2000s, who are these people? You know, I could, I basically could say, well, it could be anyone, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was sort of going into that whole um, colorblind sort of um, paradigm. Mm -hmm. that that that's that's quite prevalent 
in the 90s and, and early 2000s um, where uh, there's no, um, you're not really um, saying who or what it's about. It's sort of very generalized. You know, there's, there's Sally and Jim and John and Dave, you know, and like, and you don't really say that they're Asian Canadian and African American and, you know, um, Caucasian and First Nation, you know, you don't really uh, lend any sort of cultural identity, any identity to anybody. You just sort of, they are who they are and we'll let casting take care of it kind of thing, you know? Mm. So this was the really first time that I decided to, to, to do that. And, um, but I didn't know what to write about. There's, you know, I, I, there's a lot of way, things I could have done, like a lot of things I could have talked about. And uh, it all came from the premise. You know, it just, the premise, as soon as I had that premise, I knew I had a, a play. And the premise was, what if an elderly woman um, who lived in a First Nations community, a small First Nations community, um, was experiencing um, spirits in her home and she was able to hear them and, 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 and communicate with them. But what if her family thought she was becoming ill with dementia mm -hmm. and, and, or, or Alzheimer's? And the, the question is, is she a medium or is she sick? You know, and, and it would all take place inside of her home, inside of her house. And um, it, it wouldn't be a modern house either. It'd be sort of like a small housing that was done in a lot of First Nations in the 70s and 80s. So I had this set in my mind as well. Um, so yeah, so once I had that, that, that premise, it just, everything flowed from there. Mm -hmm. And um, it created the drama. It created my characters. It created the, it created the the conflicts, and and the um, the the dialogue, the the pacing, the tone, everything came from that premise. As soon as I came up with that premise, I remember running into my house and telling my wife about it. I was like, I, I think I got something, you know. And I told her about it, and it's like, yeah, that sounds really interesting, you know. I said, all oh, take place in, inside their home, so it's on the stage. You'd see like a little you know, living room set and a little kitchen door and all that stuff. So, so that's yeah, awesome. that's, yeah. And it's the same thing with other like screenplay ideas and, and other plays I've had, like, um, so sometimes I'll get the premise and I won't even write it. I'll just have this great premise in my mind, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really cool. Um, what was that experience like having like the first time that you actually shaped a, a show around like cultural identity has compared to like that over generalizing everything so that it's possible to fit in any box how did that shape creating that project um it it made me look at me, myself you know mm -hmm. it made me um it, it gave me a moment of self-examination you know it, it, it really um it forced me to take responsibility you know, mm -hmm. for, for who I am, um, for my experience, my life experience, you know, and um, what I've um, done or not done in my life. So, yeah, it was a really, really powerful, mm -hmm. like, experience, because, you know, like, it, it, I, I wrote it between 2008 to 2009, and um, it was, like, a, almost a two-year period. And it, and it flowed really quickly. Like it was mm -hmm. maybe a 15 month period. And it was actually between jobs because I was sort of a gig worker. You know, I, um, I've been a, um, a cook is my trade. Cooking is my trade. So I was between kitchens and between contracts and that kind of thing. So I, I ended up writing the play in between that. And uh, my kids were small at the time, so they're in elementary school. I'd send them off to school, you know, my wife would go to work, and then I would have, you know, the, the day to myself to write a play. And of course, I'd make lunch at lunchtime and all that stuff. So it was, it, it, it was a real trip because it, it, I had, I looked, I was looking back on my life. I was what, 30, 33, 34 at the time. So, was, you know, I was looking back when I was a child and, you know, my um, a pair of my grandparents were already gone 
you know, my grandfather died in the early 90s. So it's because of the, the, there's a large portion of it's about elderly people and a whole generation that are, had already mostly, for the most part, passed away. So it's, um, it, it was such a powerful experience, in fact, that when it came time to, um, to um, kill off a character, <laughs> to put it bluntly, to facilitate their, their death in writing terms, it was really, really difficult. Like mm -hmm. it, it was, it's one of the hardest things I've ever experienced in mm -hmm. terms of writing. Like I couldn't, I couldn't do it for the longest time. I couldn't write his yeah. death, you know, the character's death. And then finally when I did it, it was, yeah, it was really difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something people often overlook who aren't writers. Like they get into a series and the character dies and they get like mad at the author. It's like, well, like it's not like it's easy for authors to to do that process and um yeah you can get very attached to them as well and it's like getting rid of an actual person and it just yeah it, it's hard mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Th that's the ideal you know that's the ideal that's um you know what and it's sort of we're just kind of go to the answer of philosophy of writing a little bit mm -hmm. um when you when you experience a writer who doesn't care you know, or doesn't um, have that same kind of compassion, you know, to their own writing and to their own experience and to the, the humanity of the characters that they have on, state, on, 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 on page. It begs the question, you know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, are you, you know, if you're writing, like, say, a horror piece and you're just disposing of characters, you know, just disposing of these characters, you know, then what do you really care about mm -hmm. you know like in, in in the um in terms of who you are as a human being as a person as as a you know as an as a, a mature person you know like who are you what do you want you know how do you feel about people and humanity mm -hmm. you know uh, and if or even like an action film you know these these are sort of cliches you know like where you're just disposing of characters you know like sort of just killing off whether it be a large amount of people or just a couple of characters, you know, writing things like, and the head exploded or, you know, and, and the thing exploded or whatever. Like, you know, I think if, if, if you can't um, sort of look at yourself and say, you know, why am I writing this and why am I doing this? Am I having fun? Is this fun? You know? Mm -hmm. And, um, I always like the, the, the Miyazaki quote, um, Hayao, Hayao Miyazaki. Um, if you're if you're right, if you're drawing your your piece and you're scowling, you know, and if you're not having a good time drawing it, you know, then then why are you doing it? Mm. You know, it's the same thing I feel with writing. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so with with writing different mediums as well, like in terms of like the scripts for plays and scripts for movies and uh, I, I imagine for radio you probably do a little bit of segments that you write in advance too. Uh, what is your favorite um, I guess element of each or, or does your favorite element kind of transcend across all of them or? Uh, yeah I do have favorite elements for each piece um, I mean for each mode. Mm -hmm. um, with screenplays um, I love the the sort of the the problem solving of writing in pictures mm -hmm. um i i equate it to i've said this before but i i equate it to um creating a jigsaw puzzle and then taking apart the jigsaw puzzle mixing it up and then having to put it back together again mm -hmm. so you're 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 at first you're creating the picture and you're creating the shape of every little puzzle piece and then you take it apart and then you mix it up and put it in a box, shake it up. And then, and then you have to make your own puzzle that you invented or created. That's sort of how I equate it. It's, it's really, um, it's really challenging in that sense. Like it's really a, a problem. It really challenges your problem solving facilities like in that way, because mm -hmm. you're thinking about cuts and time and space and, you know, like, and things like that. Like, with the stage, um, I'm really thinking about the actors, mm -hmm. the real like um, ground level stuff. 
you know, like the, the, the lighting, the stage manager, the, the sound, you know, that kind of thing, like the, the frame of the stage, you know, whether it be a proscenium arch or a, or, um, or a theater in the round, you know, like really aware of, um, like I usually use the, the stage as a framing device, you know, like where I'm framing the, the action of the, the play inside of that, you know, that, that, that location, that geography. So it's, it's really, um, yeah. So I'm trying to, and I'm also trying to give, um, trying to, it's almost like trying to, excuse me, it's almost like trying to create music, you know, like mm -hmm. where you're trying to, um, lines you want to hear and rhythms you want to hear on stage, you know, like, or um, sounds or sights that you'd like to see uh, on the stage, like physically on the stage, not necessarily on the screen, but where you actually like, you know, it's like 30 feet away kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, that's, 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 that's always the challenge. So I'm thinking, always trying to think of the actors and the physical space, you know, the, the physical reality of, 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 the, of the stage. Mm -hmm. And then with um, other types of writing, it's just, you know, it's basic, basic writing. I just want to have good punctuation and, you know, just sentences that flow and that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and poetry is just a whole nother world in itself <laughs> yeah, for sure and i have to say this too like i, I just reminded this um uh, right around the time of when i wrote my play and this is a really important huge um you know tectonic shift in my development as an artist it was just gigantic um i made the decision not to write for budget anymore mm which means that I decided to write purely from my imagination, mm. you know, like just purely from my imagination, just purely from the creative world, you know, of, that I can sort of conjure and create. Um, because for a long time, I, I, I wrote for, I wrote for budgets. I wrote for mm. restraints. And that's why the, the postcard was so easy because I did that for many years, you know, where mm -hmm. I'd say, okay, I got uh, five coast, uh, five stars. They're all my classmates. Uh, we have one camera, one lighting kit. You know, uh, we can shoot at our local grocery store. I can shoot on that road. I can shoot at that river space. You know, so I'm like, kind of like have these um, these places in my mind that I'd sort of fit the story to. You know, <laughs> and I decided right around that time when I wrote the play, I was like, no more. I can't do that <laughs> anymore. You know. So I just, if I write something for the screen, it's going to be whatever it's going to be, you know, like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to, like, you might, you might look at it and say, oh, geez, this is a $65 million budget, man. You know, like, this is ridiculous, you know, like, this, or this is a period piece, you know, this is a period piece, you know, period pieces are incredibly complex, they're trying to, you know, go into production, and I, and I decided, no, I, I, I don't care. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna write it you know I'm gonna write it because I want to write it because I want to see it you know regardless of whether it's gonna go um, into production or not and it was the same mm -hmm. with uh, stage plays too a little more grounded a little more, more realistic but still like it's I wanted to sort of break the boundaries you know of, mm -hmm. uh, that I was that I was keeping for myself and and just and just write and just write because I, I was already doing it with my poetry so why was I cheating myself you know mm. in terms of screenwriting yeah. and stage yeah and yeah. and it, it was a huge breakthrough and I haven't I haven't looked back since yeah how has that shifted like your creativity and how you approach things now in terms of like yeah I, I guess I'll leave the question at that like how has it influenced your creativity oh I'm I'm, I'm fearless now mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's not a concern, you know, it, it does not matter. I just, I write because I want to write. I, I, you know, like, for example, um, my, my wife, I, I wrote the screenplay um, and it was right after my play, I wrote uh, a Kung Fu script. I, I was, a, I'm a huge martial arts fan. When I was, when I was a kid, I used to watch um, martial arts films, um, you know, Hong Kong and that kind of thing. I was, I was also into um, 
uh, Godzilla, you know, the, the Japanese Godzilla from, from the early Toho stuff right up to um, right up into the 80s. So I, I always wanted to, um, that's another thing too. I, I'd give myself challenges, you know, can I write this? Can I write that? Am I able to write this? Am I, am I able to write that? You know, and, and that's what I did with the Kung Fu script. I said, you know, can I, can I write a martial arts film? You know, how, how, can, how do you do that? You know, how can I do that? And I figured it out, you know, and a martial arts film, um, either you want to shoot it in North America or you, or you actually want to go to either China or Taiwan or wherever you want, or wherever you can shoot it. But I wrote one, I wrote a, a, a martial arts film, you know, and, and um, it was, I wrote it in, I think between 2011 and 2013. So it was like two year period. And if, if I was still in that frame of mind of sort of thinking about um, uh, constraints or restrictions or writing for budget, I don't think I'd ever be able to, wouldn't have been able to write that script because mm -hmm. it was, it was, I had freedom. You know, it, yeah. it was, it was in my mind, you know, I could, I could see it. And again, it came from, and the premise just, it, it unlocked it. Um, the premise being, um, what if two martial artists, masters married and wanted to escape their world of violence to mm -hmm. raise a family and their past um, literally comes back to hunt them. That sounds really interesting. All of yeah, your stuff, so, I'm like, oh, I want to like watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the premise came first. Mm -hmm. The idea of two martial arts masters sort of leaving that um, that wushu world mm -hmm. uh, become of uh, being bodyguards and all that stuff, and then um, leaving mainstream society. Mm -hmm. You know, this you know six seven hundred years ago, and trying to raise a family outside of that world of violence. You know, that 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 was the big thing and and i was writing in the mode of you know of trying to trying to see 14th century china or you know 15th century china so it's uh yeah and like i said i wouldn't have been able to do it if, mm -hmm. if i if i was still in that mode of thinking before that's really exciting i'm glad that you have and hearing you talk about like not not thinking about budget when you write like it's it's giving me ideas for roadblocks that I've had in different projects. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, You're welcome. I'm curious if you have a favorite form of writing or if you're just passionate about writing across all of these different forms. Um, actually, I, I'm passionate about all of them and, and, and all different in different ways and different and different um, different reasons. Um, the the poetry, you know, it's um, I remember Margaret Atwood saying um, poetry is 90% um, inspiration, 10% perspiration. Mm -hmm. And novels are 90% um, perspiration and 10% inspiration. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's just like, it's almost like dealing with sparks. You know, you just kind of, you, 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 you you're, you're creating out of thin air and you're sort of, it's very, um, nebulous and you know and ethere ethereal you know like um, I'm working with poetry and um that's that's what I really 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 love it's 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 um it's very um uh what do you call it um it's a consciousness sort of a free conscious mm. you know and um stream of consciousness in a way you're sort of tapping into that yeah and um with uh screenplays it's very um methodical and deliberate you know it's it's very um slow going mm -hmm. um excuse me um it's almost like creating a battle plan mm -hmm. you know like on 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 page but you're also trying to create these beautiful um sort of dramatic and theatrical moments you know like on page you know like for example um which is, can be really really tough mm -hmm. you know like sure you can write dialogue if this person said to that person or this happened when this happened but for example um when i wrote my kung fu script i i, I came across the the challenge of how do i write fighting mm -hmm. like how do you write that you know like because i I'd, I'd seen um plenty of um 
documentaries about it, uh, filmmaking and, and um, martial arts films. So they're, they're very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're coordinated and they take a lot of work and some fight scenes take weeks to do, you know? And I was like, how do you write that though? You know, like, do you just write and they fight? <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, but do I actually write the beats that I would like to, you know, not to use a pun, but uh, the, the, the story beats of, of, a, of a fight. So, you know, like that's, so I ended up doing that. I ended up writing a fight that has the story beats in there, but yet it's um, open enough that mm -hmm. it can be interpreted by uh, performers and coordinators, like fight coordinators. Yeah. So it's sort of kind of strange in that way. Like uh, it can be interpreted, but but yet it's still, can we hit these story beats, you know? Mm -hmm. And with the stage, um, it's very, um, I love giving to the stage. I love giving to um, theater, you know, it's because um, I'm, like I said, like I'm constantly trying to think of the actors and the the crew like the director um, and the rest of the crew of what they can physically manifest you know mm -hmm. for us as an audience to to experience you know like when we're all sitting in that space together and it could be very um if you if anybody knows if they've seen a, a great play or a play that touched them it's it's a, it's an incredible experience to go through that's um the experience was between the artist and the audience there's something there's a real connection there mm -hmm. that, that, that's that's really special and it all starts with the, the text yeah. to create that text that can um facilitate that and manifest it it's very special and having read many great plays over the years if you read waiting for godot you know, you kind of say to yourself, oh my God, like, um, how was this done? You know, <laughs> you know how, how, how was, you know, the, the, um, the journey of Vladimir and Estragon, you know, how, how, how was this, you know, how was Lucky's speech? You know, you could see it on video, but you know, like kind of, and, or even, you know, you think about Shakespeare or anything like that. So mm -hmm. it's all that text, right? That kind of gives you that physical um, reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a writer, like how how do you find the um, I'm going to refer to it as like a dance. The dance when you invite actors into like reading your words and like stage because you had talked earlier about like having the actors in mind when you write for the stage versus like film as well. When you give it to an editor, they're going to see things a little bit differently. So how do you find that uh, going from writing a project alone to then getting the writing out there in, in a way that's collaborative with these other actors or editors and and whatnot what do you find that like um it's 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 fun it's really fun in the sense that um you're 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 doing different many 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 different versions of the same thing mm -hmm. which is letting it go yeah you know, you're you're letting it go again and again and again and again in different you know for different versions of that you know like um one of the general rules of theater or, or film is um never do a reading for your actor you know like you never tell them how to say it basically you know or even or god forbid you show them how you're gonna how they should say it right mm -hmm. and it's um that's almost a big no-no right a lot of actors is oh my god you know like or, or stepping on the line, you know, he's, that actor stepped on my line and then a director did a reading for me. Like, oh, I hate that director now, you know, like now I have to say it like the way he said it or try to, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so you're constantly um, over and over again, you're, you're, you're trying to, um, you're, you're trying to give direction you're trying to sort of, um, help or aid in creating the piece whether you're a director or a producer or you're the writer and that's a part of the team you know which is a big important part of it is that it's a it's a team sport you know yep. like creating a, a, a stage play or a film um, it, it takes many minds to to put it all together 
So as the chief um, creator being the writer, you're, you're sort of um, given many opportunities to, to, like I said, let it go, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, and you're asked to sort of, sort of put it into your hands again and take it out of your hands, put it in your hands, take it out of your <laughs> hands, you know. So, and eventually at the very end here, you know, you, it's, it's the audiences. So then that's the ultimate letting go of it because mm -hmm. you, you spent all that time with it. Now it's up to the interpretation, right? And becomes, as, as you know, like it, 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 it has a life of its own after, you know, mm -hmm. just, just ask the creators of Home Alone or Die Hard or, you know, or a famous production of Rent or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. as, and it has its own life to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, um, so earlier you had talked about like this idea of like writing without the budget in mind. And I'm I'm wondering because living so far north and being in an isolated community, that shifts with the budget as well, right? In terms of usually in smaller communities, they don't have as much budget to work with for these things. So um, if you wanted to talk a little bit now, shifting gears into what it's like being an artist away from like those larger networks um, and how how that process is impacted how you engage in art and just what what it's like and and to uh, navigate all of that i guess mm -hmm. um this is where uh the, the the story might get a little tragic or sad <laughs> you know in, in terms of my my creative life uh and and talking about writing and and, and you know the, that sort of thing um I guess the, the the bottom line or or the simplest way to say it is that I I had to forsake production. Mm. I had to forsake publication. Meaning that I had to forget about that world. You know, I had to forget I had to um forget that um about that that possibility that my kung fu script can go into production. I I could not when I was writing the script, I could not live with the reality of trying to get a script like that on its feet, because mm -hmm. that's a different animal in itself. That's a that's a whole different uh, kettle of fish. You know that that I can't do both at the same time, and um, not unless there are um, sort of perf proficient um, professional parameters involved. You know, meaning that um, say uh, a writer gets hired to do a script for a television show or a film, they're on retainer, they're on, um, they're, they, they're being paid essentially to do the work. They're doing updates and different meetings and stuff like that, getting notes, you know, all of that, that, that sort of that, that production sort of world, I, I just, I could not think about it or I could not, I had to forsake it, I had to forget about it. So, um, which is strange. Uh, it's a strange thing to do because um, I'm essentially a creative, to, to sort of use the parlance of our, of the terminology of, of our time in terms of um, arts, I guess. <laughs> um, I am purely a creative. I, I have no production partner. I have no producing partner. I have no writing partner. I have no management. I have no representation. Um, I have a dramaturge, but that's you know sort of been a late development in the last couple of years. Uh, so that's um, when I when I'm speaking about all of this is purely from a creative's point of view, okay. um, and uh, I've always said that I, I've always wanted to. Uh, create a body of work first mm -hmm. before I enter that world because that world is that's when you start getting into negotiations mm -hmm. that's when you start it's not really about the work anymore like the actual creating of the script it's more about um, trying to wrangle opportunities um, the hustle of it all you know trying to um, find a producing partner trying to find representation um, networking, you know, inside of that world, like whether it be for the stage or for um, for the screen or even publication, you know, like for my, my books of poetry and whatnot. Mm -hmm. 
So all of that is, is our energies that have to be, you have to commit. You, you, yeah. you have to commit 110%, you know, to, to that effort of trying to get your film on screen or get your uh, play on stage or, you know, or your, or your book published. And in that sense, too, you're dealing with money. Mm-hmm. And money is a very, very, very serious issue. There's, there's no messing around with it. There's no kidding around with it. And there's very, very small margins of error, you know, with, uh, when, you're, when you're working with money um, and, and trying to get um, pieces off the ground, especially when you're talking about pieces that are in the tens, hundreds, even millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, um, there's, like I said, there's, no, there's not a lot of um, room for error in that world. So um, it's almost like putting on a different hat. Yeah. You know, like it's it's um, like a different side of um, the human personality, I guess. <laughs> and I've been totally and utterly and completely focused on being a creative, <laughs> hmm. which which lends itself to, to the isolation, which is a good thing. You know, it's um, yes, I'm isolated, and you know, I, I don't have a lot of networking um abilities which is why i'm relishing this conversation right now (laughs) because i haven't talked shop with anybody about anything in in terms of art or creativity in in years months you know Mm -hmm. um so it's it's uh it's it's a real uh refreshing um a breath of fresh air right now speaking to you about all of this stuff but um the isolation itself lends itself to being a creative because Mm -hmm. that's all you focus on you know, you wake up in the morning, you have the script staring at you or the, the poetry or the play, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's um, I, I, I can't imagine being here in Moose Factory and trying to facilitate a, a $5 million film, mm. you know, the, being on Zoom calls and talking on the phone and trying <laughs> to find a DP and a you know, and, and uh, oh, we got to do a, a scouting uh, 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 location scout, you know, three months from now. How can you get out here? And I can't think that's, that's going to be a whole nother uh, thing in itself. And one day I do hope to get to that place where I feel, okay, I wrote these scripts. I wrote these plays. I wrote this. Now I could hustle, you know, mm-hmm. and it'll be, you know, a totally different um, effort altogether. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like right now it's like good not to have to mix those hats and just be able to focus on the writing and and enjoy the process of it too. And as I find like it's easy to get caught up in uh, rather than like building like a library essentially of all these different things, uh, people can write once and it becomes like their baby and then they're off like chasing the dream instead of like being involved in that creative process over time. And yeah. Yeah, like um, I, I, if it, if anybody like yourself or anybody else out there knows, if you've done any kind of um, uh, reading on history, you know that there there are some creatives or some people, some teams, they they've written a film or they wrote a play, and it took them ten years to get to the screen or the stage, with that play that they wrote, you know, earlier that day dec- that decade. And they didn't do anything else in between. You know, they yeah. might have had a side deal where they doctored a script or helped facilitate somebody to get to here or something like that. But they didn't do anything else in between. All their efforts after that initial two years or th- or X amount of years of writing the script, the rest of that time was just all trying to get, you know, raise the funds, get their mm-hmm. team, the whole production rigmarole, right? It's It's just... It's, it's crazy. And, and sometimes even longer, you know, like decades, mm-hmm. you know, trying to get uh, things to the screen or to the stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you had mentioned earlier too, uh, or before we even started recording, I guess it was like, like reading plays a big factor in, in I guess, your inspiration and whatnot. So uh, did you want to speak a little bit to that and how that influences your writing? Yeah. Um, the... Uh, my first year in college, my first semester, actually, I was taking an English course, and we had opportunity to um, 
to go to uh, um, presentations for different writers. There's like a writer's uh, seminar that we were able to visit. So we'd, we'd go listen to a writer speak about their, their art and, you know, the, the, they were published writers, you know, and things like that. And uh, our, our, our professor at the time, he, the, she would um, encourage us, you know, go, go see them, go listen to them talk, you know, listen to them talk about their art. And I went, you know, a couple of times out of maybe six. And this one time uh, we went and he was a really great writer and he talked, uh, he, was, he was an excellent uh, speaker about his art. And this, I remember this one question, um, I was eight, 19, 20 at the time, uh, 19, 20, uh, 20, 21 at the time. And uh, this one question was posed to him and he said, they said, what's your best advice for a writer? you know, to, um, uh, to any writer that, that wants to be a professional writer. And um, he, he said two, he said three words. He said, read and write. Mm -hmm. That's all. So that's it. Just read and write, you know, write anything you can write all the time, write. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a paragraph or, you know, 10 pages, just write. And then he said, read, 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 read anything you can get your hands on, read anything you want, read, you know, whatever. And that's sort of one of the things that um, I find is forgotten whenever you see, you, you watch YouTube videos on, on writing or, you yeah. know, all these different, you know, like advice, you know, columns on writing. Um, I think that's one of the most important things that, um, that you can do for yourself when mm -hmm. you're a writer is read. It's, it's so important. And if the, and if you were, if, if you were a reader when you're five years old and you've never stopped, that's great. Then you're ahead of the curve. But if you haven't read much when you're a teen and your twenties are all fun and you haven't, you know, read much and say, well, get back on it, mm -hmm. start reading again, you know, like, and if you want to be a novelist, read novels. If you want to mm -hmm. be a screenwriter, read you know, screenplays, you know, if, or books on screenplays or that sort of thing. If you want to read, if you want to read, uh, write plays and read plays, you know. But um, another thing too is, I remember Margaret Atwood also saying, um, read what you love. You know, mm -hmm. like don't don't just feel you should read, you know, uh, War and Peace and Crime and Punishment. You know. To, to go into Russian literature there, but um, read what you love. If you love reading, you know, V.C. Andrews, then read V.C. Andrews, you know, mm -hmm. apart from, you know, Dostoevsky or, or um, you know, Gatsby, Great Gatsby or something like that. So, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's, and I, and when I heard that, it sort of rang a bell because I was already reading through high school when I was, when I was a kid. So it, it made me it sort of reinforce the idea that, you know, keep reading, <laughs> keep reading, you know, just keep reading what you want to read, you know, yeah. and it hasn't stopped, you know, I said to this day, you know, like I, um, for example, I wrote a play um, about five years ago called Ladylike, and um, I just finished reading um, Agme Ag Agmegnon, the, the, uh, the Greek play, and I wrote, I wrote a couple of uh, uh, I read a couple of uh, Greek plays. I was sort of going through a little period there. And um, I love the idea of chorus, um, Greek chorus. Mm. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Greek uh, theater, uh, ancient Greek theater specifically, uh, in many of the plays, the existing plays now, there's, there's a Greek chorus involved, whether it's a tragedy or a, a comedy. And these Greek choruses that they have, they're almost like answering calls. So mm -hmm. uh, a character will speak or say a speech and um, that will be the, the, um, the call. And then the answer will be from the chorus. And the chorus will, it usually has sort of a third person perspective where they'll answer the question on a sort of more cosmic scale, right? They'll, you know, oh, what can I do to, to save my life? Well, you could save your life by, you know, that sort of thing, you know? And um, when I'm reading about, when you read about the, the, the history of Greek theater, those choruses were huge. They were huge. 
you know, 40, 50 people in, a, in those courses, you know, um, they were gigantic. And when you read the lines with that information in your mind, you're trying to picture 40 or 50 people saying, to live the life that you want to live, you know, like uh, stay with the gods or something like that, I'd say. And you're trying to picture, hear that, you know, plus, the, you know, it's a, they're in those large Greek um, prosceniums, right? There's where there's, you know, 100 people sitting on steps in front of them. So they're trying to reach, you know, all the way back and have everybody hear what they say. So it just, you know, they, and reading that, recently when i went through that period um it really really grabbed my imagination mm -hmm. and i said i want to play with that i want to i want to try that so i ended up writing chorus for my for that play um it wasn't a 40 40 or 50 person chorus <laughs> but it was a small chorus but i, I wanted to experiment with that mode mm -hmm. and um i wouldn't have known yeah i wouldn't have known that if i if i hadn't read the plays and i hadn't had read the uh, the history of of Greek theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever had a time where it's been more difficult to read or like, uh, cause I know for myself, I've been through, like I've, I was a reader at a young age and would read like tons of books, especially like over summer when you're not in school and you have the time for it. <laughs> but then mm -hmm. when I was getting my university degree, you're reading so many textbooks that for me, I found it harder to read on the, on the side. Cause it felt, even though you're reading like a novel, to me, it felt like schoolwork, even though it wasn't. <laughs> so yeah. I'm wondering if there's any times that you've kind of felt that same, um, had more of a disconnect with reading and what advice you would give someone who maybe it doesn't come as naturally to read for them and, and how they can kind of uh, feed that drive to read. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll tell a story. Um, I, I just finished Lord of the Rings. Like, like two weeks ago, something like that, like 10 days ago, I just finished all of them, like the, the Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. I just finished reading the whole, I call it one book because it was in one, you know, one volume. <laughs> and it took, I started reading it in 2010. Wow. I, started, I started reading it in 2010 and I just finished. Um, it's, it's an amazing series. I, I read The Hobbit when I was a teenager but I and I had friends who read the books when they were teenagers and younger, and they kept saying, and the younger, they kept saying, "Read, read Lord of the Rings, read Lord of the Rings." You know, oh my God, they're so great! And I'd always tell them, "Okay, okay, I'll read the Lord of the Rings when when I can." You know, mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd finish it when I was in my forties, so it's it was uh, quite a journey um, mm -hmm. for me to to go through, especially when you're in the journey in the book too. It's like sort of it's. Kind of parallel you know in that way so um if and in that sense too like it was a real um lord of the rings is a really difficult book to read in that sense because it's it's the um not only you're dealing with the the story points of you know frodo and gandalf and you know aragorn and everybody but also you're getting a lot of world building descriptions mm -hmm. and it can be really um, if that's not your thing, it could be really tedious. So it's, and, you, and he's, he's even giving directions, north, south, west, east, you know, like I remember lying there or sitting there like, okay, east of the Misty Mountains, and you're kind of trying to see it in your mind and everything. So, um, but it, you have to persevere, is my mm -hmm. point. You know, it, it, it's important to persevere through um, not just what you're reading, but also um, the act of, of reading itself, because I could have given up years ago, you know, years ago. And, and not to say too that that's all I've read in that 10 year period. I, I read many, 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 many different books, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in between that one book. So um, read what you love, read what you can, and read, and read what you want to read. You know, like it's if, if you love reading Reader's Digest then read Reader's Digest, you know, if you love um, Stephen King novels, then, you know, then do that, you know, but it just it's important to persevere, you know, just, mm -hmm. just keep going. And, and if you really try and you really attempt to read something that might be beyond your ability or beyond your understanding, 
or even beyond your emotional or um, if you want to get spiritual, um, like a spiritual um, uh, maturity, just breakthrough, breakthrough, just keep going, just keep going, you know, because it's, um, that's the beauty of reading, you know, it's, you, you, you're, you're constantly trying to um, get through the, the words and the meaning, and you'll, you'll find it, you'll definitely mm -hmm. find it, you know, um, when I wrote a screenplay, um, which I'm still working on to this day, I was always trying to find a through line for it, like a theme, something that can help me sort of get um, a grasp on on the, the theme itself. And it has something to do with spirituality and bad faith and that kind of thing, um, uh, redemption. And I didn't know um, how to sort of handle and sort of deal with that myself. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I was given a book for Christmas one year by my parents, and it was uh, um, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. And I always wanted to read Dostoevsky. I, thought, I always thought I'd start with um, Crime and Punishment. Uh, but um, I was given this book by my parents. And with, um, it took me about four years to read, you know, like three and a half years to read. And like I said, I had other books going. That's actually one of my secrets i guess is that i always have more than one book going mm -hmm. i have five six seven books going at, at one point at one time you know and um so um i'll finish one and i'll keep going at another and i'll finish that one and, you know i'll start another and yeah so i have all these bookmarks and books <laughs> like lying all over my house but when i and um dostoevsky can be a really tough read and uh, especially with all the Russian names and, you know, and, and places, um, I ended up finding um, my theme inside of Brothers Karamazov. And nice. it just, it just hit like, like lightning. It was amazing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I wouldn't have found that. I wouldn't have found that if I did, if I hadn't have, I hadn't have read, not only just read it, but also um, persevered and, and tried to get through it. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's an amazing book. And I didn't realize it was this, I learned later that it was his last novel and it's his most complex novel. So I was like, oh, wow, what a, what a way to start. Das, 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 das. <laughs> yeah, well, now you're ready for all the others. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely find that same thing. So I think that's like really useful advice that we, you don't have to read one thing at once or like when you were talking about um, if you're if you're not at like the spiritual maturity or, or or whatnot to read the book you're at for me i have actually been reading books before and then i put it down and i might not even touch it again for another year and then you just happen to be at that right place in your life that it, it makes sense for where you are and then suddenly you get through the rest of it in like a couple of days sometimes even so uh -huh. yeah like like that um not putting ourselves in a box in terms of how we're reading but like that circular nature of being willing to come back to books or shelve them for a couple of months or whatnot and then still get something out of them. Mm -hmm. And another thing to remember too is that um, the more you read, the easier it gets. Mm, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things that, that um, you, like, especially if, um, if there's a young person listening to this um, one day or, 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 or right now, I guess mm -hmm. you could say, um, don't give up, you know, keep, keep reading, keep reading more. And, and, and you'll find that it just gets easier and easier and mm -hmm. easier. For example, um, I read um, Great Expectations a few years back, as I always wanted to read uh, Dickens, Charles Dickens. I read, um, I read uh, The Christmas Carol when I was in high school, uh, only because it was the shortest of his books. And um, I picked up great, great expectations. I think it was like 2014, 2015. It took me a couple of years, about a year and a half to read. Of course, I'm reading all this other stuff in between, but um, I, I, I don't think I would have been able to do it as read it as well as I did if I was 20 or 18, mm. you know, like um, it was easier to understand the the facility, you know, like it was, was I had the muscle, the muscle mass to to handle it, to handle great expectations, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. So, and, and the same can be said of 
of plays, of, of screenplays, and things like that too. Yeah, it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really fascinating in that sense. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. And the words and how you read will really, really flow. And then when you do sort of double back and you start reading, say, the newspaper or articles online or um, um, essays, that kind of thing, uh, it's it, it sort of, you'll find yourself sort of like, geez, this is a breeze. You know, mm -hmm. this is actually a lot easier than I thought it would be, you know, and that's only because you're constantly, constantly working out, you know, like in, in the sense of reading and mm -hmm. it feeds your writing, it feeds your writing, you know, it, 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 it gives you not just inspiration, but it, it, it opens uh, possibilities and worlds and doors for you, you know, in, in your imagination. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think like, the other thing too is if, if you are newer to reading don't be ashamed of having to like look words up because then you know them for like ever or like i've found certain authors will have certain words that they'll use like time and time again and to them it's just like a natural world but like to me i'm like i've never heard of this before so yeah. the more yeah. that you do that the more when a different author uses it like you recognize that term and it's no longer like foreign to you 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 know it and you know what they're intending to get across exactly exactly and it, it's um, sort of on a feedback loop, you know, it kind of goes, it goes, you know, around and around and around, you know, where you, where you sort of, um, yeah, it, it, it really, really does, you know, kind of become easier in that sense. And it, another thing too is, um, I remember when I was really young, I was like, I'm maybe 10, 9, 10, 11 years old, my, my father was a big reader. Uh, but he was a recreational reader, but he was a really fast reader. You know, he loved Louis L'Amour books and John LeClaire and that kind of thing. Eh? And Stephen King books. We had books in the house all over the place. And he, I, I was always amazed with how fast he would read. Mm -hmm. And I'd ask him, I asked him one time, I, I you know, challenged him basically. And I said, why do you read so fast? You know, and, and basically he says, um, he said to me, he asked me a question actually he posed the question back to me he says when you read when you read your stories do you read every word and i, I, I kind of had to think about it and i said uh yeah you know kind of like yeah of course yeah, of course i read every word and i said yeah and he said why he said you don't have to and it, it kind of blew my mind i was like well, what do you mean i said like well when you read when you read the story and he says he said, um, he said uh, affectionately. Do you read he said it affectionately or just look at it? Because he mm -hmm. said, you know, you've seen those two words so many times, especially in a book. Do you read that word or do you look at it and mm -hmm. know what it is? I was like, I usually read it, but I see what you're saying. I told him like, so, you know, like you kind of get into these little, you know techniques these little tricks mm -hmm. that you kind of learn as, as you go on and he was right he was right like um you know i remember saying that to for, sort of repeating the same maxim to a friend of mine who didn't like foreign films because he said i have to read them i said you read them <laughs> like, you know like when you look up at the screen and you say and the character says um i love you with all my heart do you sit there and go, I love you with all my heart? Or do you just look at it and then you recognize the, you know, mm -hmm. 10 syllables or whatever, you know, on, on the screen. So those little things too come into play where you actually start having your own technique and your own way of reading, you know, like whether it's something like that or, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you be willing to share some of your favorite pieces of literature that you've read before for the audience? Oh, sure. Um, I'm a huge Beckett fan. <clears throat> I love um, absurdism, uh, theater of the absurd. So um, I'm waiting for Godot, um, Happy Days. Um, um, what else? Uh, I'm trying to think of his other plays. Uh, where, um, Eye Mouth. You know, like his, I, I love all his plays. I'm a huge um, Beckett fan. I just read his um, his autobiography recently, which I always wanted to do. 
always wanted to read that autobiography. Um, what else? Uh, I love um, I love um, classic theater. So uh, Tennessee Williams, Eugene O'Neill. Um, uh, uh, what else? Um, yeah, so that's that's a lot of plays, a lot of plays that, that I love to read. Um, especially going Ibsen, I really liked Ibsen. Yeah, the Dollhouse, you know, I think it was was it was a great read for me. Um, Mammoth, David Mammoth, uh, Glengarry Glen Ross, uh, uh, American Buffalo. Um, but then there's uh, novels that I love too, like. Like I said, Brothers Karam Karamazov was an amazing read. Um, I just read um, Animal Farm, finally, just, just recently. Um, Fahrenheit 451. Um, uh, Atwood, Atwood's uh, The Blind Assassin. That was an amazing experience. Um, ben Okery, The Famished Road. Um, uh, that was an amazing experience to, to go through. Um, what else? Uh, I read Toni Morrison's Jazz when I was a teenager, and it was—I I thought it was an amazing thing. But now, looking back on it, I don't think I was ready for it. You know, I think it was, it was a little beyond me. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably want to revisit not just jazz, but Beloved or something like that as well. Of course, I'm always reading poetry. So like the classic poets, you know, like whether it be Canadian, like uh, Irving Layton, or um, someone like William Blake, you know, or something, mm -hmm. or John Donne. Um, I, 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 would, I try to revisit John Doan every, every couple of years just because of the complexity of his metaphysical poetry. Yeah. You know, um, it's just, it's so complex, so insanely complex. And it's almost like trying to get, trying to read the, um, the uh, schematics for a rocket. You know, yeah. like it's, it's just so, <laughs> so insane. Like where, you know, like they'd say you could see, you could see, uh, the fingerprint of God in a comma with John mm -hmm. Doan, you know, like, and it's like, what, you know, <laughs> the real, you know, like getting some really, really heady stuff, right? like with, with um, metaphysical poetry. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, then, then of course, you know, like I've, I've, I've always been a Roald Royal Dahl fan um, that like, I was a huge Royal Dahl fan when I was a kid. So I, I'm actually reading, um, um, uh, the, I'm reading one of his novels right now, actually one of his stories. Um, the, I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, but yeah, so it's, yeah, this Royal Doll, it's, it's, I'm a huge fan of his as well. And yeah, like, and I try to read books on, on, um, on theater too, like um, mm -hmm. the theater uh, theory, theatrical theory. Yeah. So I, I read some Jersey Grotowski um, uh, Peter Brooks. I revisit his, uh, his book, The Empty Space, every few years. Uh, actually, I'm reading it right now. Uh, the Empty Space is, really talks about like the holy theater, the rough mm -hmm. theater, you know, that kind of thing. You're getting into this, like, like, um, like I said, like the theory of, um, of the stage, yeah. um, almost like poetics, but just purely with theater. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. That's a very extensive list. And yeah, for those of you who are looking to get into reading now, you have lots of options to choose from and jump in and just test something out and see what you think of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, another thing too is um, I always I always read myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there are some writers that they're, they're notorious for, for being embarrassed or they don't like to go back and read what they've wrote. I have what I've written. I have stuff that I wrote when I was 14, 15 years old. Nice. Uh, everything from poetry to plays to essays. So I'm, I'm, I, I read what I've written in the past too. Not, not just out of necessity, but, um, but because um, I always said, I said this to my wife once. I said, um, one of the, the, the dreams as a writer when you're young is that you always wish you had an editor especially an older mm -hmm. editor, you know, somebody who can sort of, sort of guide you through the process of, of writing and who better to guide, guide you through your writing than you, mm -hmm. you know, especially when it's 25, 30 years later, you know, 
mm -hmm. and to sort of help um, yourself, but also you're, you're sort of revisiting writing that you might not feel that you're, you know, that's up to snuff anymore, or, mm -hmm. you know, it's not to your skill level, but um, it sort of brings you down to in the sense of the ego or vanity, you know, that you're willing to revisit your own writing, you know, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm constantly rereading scripts that I've re read, poetry mm -hmm. that I've written, you know, essays that I've done. So it, that, that always helps to rereading what you've written. Yeah. Do you find that diving into some of your older stuff influences your current creativity and just like getting to see yourself at that age in a new light, like influence any of your current projects at all? Oh, for sure. Um, for example, I, I wrote, a, I read a, I wrote a, a screen, um, a short screenplay in high school with a friend of mine uh, called Who Stole the Cookies from the Cookie Jar? And it was based on that, that, uh, that that uh, song that that uh, that childhood song you know who stole mm -hmm. the cookies from the cookie jar so we based it on that and i read it a few years ago and it's all handwritten you know on, on um uh longhand on on, mm -hmm. on uh, legal legal pad but I, i'm sort of fascinated by the idea that we're so um audacious in a way that we're taking this um, sort of this this nursery rhyme or this children's song and trying to stretch it into this you know long sketch you know this mm -hmm. sort of funny sort of sketch and I could see the mistakes that I made you know like the, with with formatting and with character development and things like that and so oh, I I could I've even actually um, thought of like going back and rewriting it and mm -hmm. and and doing it properly you know and sort of which would be a dream of my 19, 18 year old self to say, to have a four year old saying, you know, hey, you know, give me that, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, it, you can really definitely see the, um, the flaws that you had mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're younger in writing. And it sort of makes you aware, you know, that when you're writing now that, you know, like, not that you don't want to make that mistake, but that you're willing to sort of work through mm. those yeah. things. And it's like reading too. The more you write, the easier it gets. Yeah. You know? And and not just with the the um, mechanics of writing, like you know, um, run on sentences and grammar and all that stuff, but also the creativity, sort of mm -hmm. creating. You know, it's sort of um, it gets easier to sort of create. You know, and to sort of um, come up with ideas and just sort of harbor a, sort of a creative mindset when you sit down instead of sitting there and like going ah, you know I don't know what to write you know it's sort of just sit there and start you know just flow 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 mm -hmm. you know and 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 being able to sort of break through that you know whereas when you're younger it, it, you might have been sort of wrestling with those with those things you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, do you find your style has a writer too, like compared to your younger self, becomes more natural or like every author kind of has their own, um, like sometimes with authors, you can tell that it's an author's work, even if it's like a completely different piece. So I'm wondering, yeah. like for you, did you find that that got easier to do over time or just like coming into your own as an author? Um. I was well as as a young as a young person when I was a teenager. Um, it it was it was almost the equivalent of like um, a child saying I could jump over that, mm -hmm. you know I, I I could reach that, you know I I could do that, you know that's that's almost what the equivalent was, um, like oh I could write thirty pages on on a a play about two boys falling in a well. You know, which, which is what I did, you know, when I was 15, I wrote a short play about uh, two kids stuck in a well and how they, you know, how they, um, how they survive and how they deal with it. So mm -hmm. it was almost like a, like an, a creative dare, you know, mm -hmm. to try to get through, you know, to try to write. And it's almost like everything I was writing at that age was, hey, I'll, I'll try that. I'll do that. You know, I'll, 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 even though I may not have had the skill or the ability or the um, experience, you know, I, um, where I, I can 
you know, it's like you you you, you try it because you, you you feel immortal and you, you feel like you, you know invincible and you can do anything. And I can, of course, I can write it. You know, and it's funny that when um, in my early twenties I came up with a screenplay idea that was a brick wall. It just it stopped me in in, in my tracks. Like I couldn't I couldn't use that same logic anymore. I guess I couldn't say. Oh, I could do that. Of course I can. You know, I, I can, I can write anything, you know, and I was actually what a few years removed from being a teenager. And, and I, I knew it was a reality that I had to sort of um, face, you know, and um, it was a, a screenplay idea. Actually the premise, I came up with another a great premise. It was about um, these young actors who are at their wits end, they're about to be, um, their, their career isn't taking off. They live in a metropolis and um, they're about to be, you know, basically evicted from their lives and they're about to like lose everything. And um, one day they're, they go to an audition and they're um, recruited for a play, but it's not a play. They're recruited by a uh, con artist to be actors in his con and they're given a choice you know to either do this job what might be morally morally repugnant but it'll pay for their life or take the artist's route and you know go down the dark road of seeing what will happen when, when they're being evicted out of their lives and uh, I knew when I came up with the idea that I wasn't mature enough to write it mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about con um, con artists. I didn't know anything about grifters. I didn't know anything about that world. Um, I didn't have the maturity uh, to write the, the the lead character like the old con artist and his and to create his his grift uh, yeah. on these young actors. <clears throat> I was just I was like in my early twenties, so I did have that com that that um, perspective of a young person, not. Um, sort of developing the way they want to do mm -hmm. but I knew I didn't have that maturity and I told it to a friend of mine and he loved it he's like oh it sounds like an amazing role oh, an amazing play a reason and I said I'm not I'm not gonna write it and he's like why because I, I, I I'm not mature enough I don't have I, I don't have the experience I'd have to do like a ton of research and you know learn all this stuff and he said write it write it write it and I was like oh my god so I ended up writing a play based on that premise for college. But I ended up tackling the screenplay years later and I'm still working on it to this day. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on this, this screenplay for 20 years now. And um, I feel more confident now though, because I did do the research. Mm -hmm. I have, I've had the, the maturity. I, I, I've written screenplays and other modes um, and other ideas and other uh, creative venues. And um, I do understand the old con artists now more than ever, you know, and um, it's gotten easier, you know, like, so there's more, um, when you get older and, and you're mature, uh, maturing, um, you don't have that sort of uh, dare sort of, uh, sort of, um, um, that sort of attitude towards writing anymore. It's more methodical and you, you sort of think more and, and it actually starts affecting you, you know, like, like mm -hmm. I said, with that character when I wrote, um, wrote the Sandcastle, you know, it took a, a long time for me to, 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 uh, to, to uh, kill off that character. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I don't think I would have been able to do that when I was 18, you know, yeah. so I had to grow, grow into that. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that really speaks to like the patience with the process that's needed and not expecting it to be like, oh, I'm going to write this in a year, but like just letting it unfold over in this case, like decades for the one that you're still working on. So yeah, not rushing yourself as a writer, which is really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's an amazing um, thing to go through, which, which kind of blows my mind when I, when you read like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You know, she's she's only twenty five, a little younger than that. She's like twenty one. She when she wrote Frankenstein, um, or or even some like Sil Sylvia Plath. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm I'm twenty years older than Mary Shelley was when she wrote Frankenstein. 
I'm at least 15 years older than Sylvia Plath was, you know, when she wrote The Bell Jar. So it, it kind of gives you, there's a strange, you know, like the strange um, anomalies, I guess, artistic mm -hmm. anomalies like that. But as a young person, you can't say, oh, I'm Sylvia Plath. I'm going to write The Bell Jar at 27 or 29, you know, or write um, uh, Frankenstein, you know. Um, the, those are really, really bizarre anomalies, you know. Mm -hmm. Even someone like Emily Dickinson, you know, like who wrote her poetry at such such a young age, you know, like um, into her, well, into her thirties later. But yeah, it's like, but you have to remember how much they're reading and writing. There's so many realities that yeah. you sort of have to take into account uh, if you sort of have that sort of um, bombastic attitude mm -hmm. towards your own uh, towards your own art your own um, um your own craft you know mm -hmm. so it, but the, the key the key though is just keep going keep writing keep reading keep you know taking in more and more and more and you know and it'll 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 happen you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing you know, whether whether you like it or not actually <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and when it's meant to too i think sometimes we want to decide when that moment's going to be and uh well I'm, I'm a firm believer that things line up when they're supposed to and yeah mm -hmm. yeah there is sort of a serendipitous kind of you know um uh thing to it all you know mm -hmm. when, when it comes to when it comes to reading or writing you know whether it's uh, um, uh, whether it's meant to happen or not yeah. you know that that's sort of a reality to take on too mm -hmm. that's something that i had to accept early 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 on that um I can't think about production or publication, mm -hmm. you know, that I have to set it aside, you know, and, and it's kind of tough too when you, when you have such a wide view of the world from where I am, you know, like I'm, mm -hmm. um, not only am I isolated in Canada, but I'm isolated inside the world too. So I've watched mm -hmm. the independent film movement sort of crumble in the nineties. And I saw CGI, you know, rise in the early two thousands and, you know, uh, Marvel, you know, turn into a you know, huge, gigantic thing. And I saw theater kind of fall sort of, you know, and become smaller and more regional, but yet, you know, come away with me becomes this, you know, $10 million juggernaut and Broadway. And, you know, it's, you're just watching all these things happen, you know, and you sort of, um, once in a while you feel the pull, the grav gravitational pull of, of, of seeing, um, you know, fast runner become a, a huge uh, hit at cons in 2001 you're like oh this Inuit filmmaker did that oh I could do that too you know yeah. and but it's just have to kind of you know kind of just accept that you are where you are and you do what you do and in time things things will happen you know mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah uh, so what kind of projects do you currently have underway and and where uh where can people find you in the future and, and what are you looking to do uh, within the next couple of years with your art? Well, um, uh, I just finished the play. Well, I'm just finishing a play actually. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new play, uh, brand new. Um, I hope to have it um, uh, read and, and sort of uh, take it through the dramaturge process in the next year or two. Um, so that's, it, it doesn't even have a title. <laughs> so, that's so brand new it is. I've been working on it. Um, I actually I started just before the pandemic, so I've been writing it through the through the pandemic, and it's another First Nations story, and it's a spiritual sequel to the Sandcastle, the the story about the um, the elderly woman who is a medium or or is um, is, is ill. So it's a spiritual sequel to that. Um, instead of focusing on the matriarch of, of a family, it's it's um, it's uh, focusing on the patriarch of a family. So it's uh, on a, on a, on a male uh, elder instead of a female elder, and um, it deals with sacred space and 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 sort of um, uh, ritual rituals and that kind of thing too. Like which is kind of what Sandcastle is, except it's from uh, a female um, point of view. Um, We've been working on the Sandcastle for some time. We've been, um, we meaning, um, meaning Pat the Dog uh, Theater out of um, uh, Kitchener and Waterloo. We've been trying to 
uh, workshop it. We've been, uh, we did a reading of it in 2017, a live reading. Um, and we're trying to eventually get it on its feet, which is actually <laughs> uh, that whole thing of me saying, getting into production. We're, we're sort I'm sort of dipping my toes into that pool of, of trying to have it be a production, an actual mm -hmm. play. It, it's a huge play. There's like 15 characters in it. It's, yes. it's probably gonna be three and a half hours long. It's like 65 pages. It's, 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 re it's a really dense piece. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, and there's a lot of uses of silence and, um, um, avant-garde sort of absurdist kind of angle to do too so um so hopefully we can um not only i guess keep workshopping it but maybe one day get it off the ground it's it'll be a really expensive play too so we're talking about we're sort of like talking about banding about money amounts and stuff like that so mm -hmm. um i'm working on well this project of course project nation and the podcast and a couple of other side projects with with that um i'm always writing screenplays so um i'm working on a sixth draft of a grifter's faith which is the screenplay that i was alluding to earlier about working on for 20 years um i'm working on a sixth draft finished the fifth draft in 2018 and my brother and i are going to try to Again, just like the sandcastle, try to get it on its feet, <laughs> try to go into production. Well, <laughs> I would say I, I'll, I'll give myself a wide berth and I'll say in the next 10 years. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to finish this draft and then um, submit it to my brother and um, so that he can sort of try to sell it, you know, to <laughs> basically try to um, try to get it producing partners and things like that. So that'd be that'd be even doing a um, proof of concept film, a short film format out of that, out of that uh, mm -hmm. screenplay. Nice. And um, yeah, those are the main things. But like I said, I'm, I'm always working on some kind of project or another. Like for example, I've had a, um, I've been working on this graphic novel for the last ten years. Um, I, I met an artist a couple of years. A few, a number of years ago and he challenged me to write something for, for him he was uh he was an illustrator uh he moved out of town now but um i was i was left with this gigantic <laughs> gigantic idea when we when we came up with the concept I, I remember telling him hey can we do something really really simple uh like we're, we're gonna create a, a comic book together a graphic uh, novel and he says, yeah, you write, you write it. I'll read it. I'll uh, illustrate it. And said, yeah, can we come up with something really, really, really simple? And I, I gave him a, a premise, actually. I said, how about we do a story about an obese child and, and their challenges, what they, what they go through, mm -hmm. you know, the daily challenges of, of an obese child, you know, going to school and, you know, friends, bullying, all that stuff, right? And uh, we'll call it obese, I told him, you know. And he said, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Let's, let's, let's work out something else. He said, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep, uh, let's keep um, um, brainstorming. So I said, okay. So we brainstormed a couple other ideas. And then I came up with an idea of uh, a far science fiction future of humanity and how um, instead of, you know how like these days they, they, um, they do uh, transplants, like heart transplant mm -hmm. by, you know, uh, um, lungs, that kind of thing. And they, 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 tra they uh, transport these um, organs all over the world, you know, all over Canada, all over the United States. And they'll, they'll send a heart to New York or send a, you know, lungs to Britain or whatever. And I said, what, what if instead of um, transporting organs in our far future, they're transporting consciousness? Mm. I like so they, they take, so somebody dies, and then they take their consciousness out of their their body. They put it in a machine like a computer matrix. They go to the other side of the galaxy, and they 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 give that consciousness to, you know, um, a temple or or the, this rich guy wants to transport his consciousness into a 
into a cyborg, you know, mm-hmm. cybernetic organism because he wants to live forever because he's, you know, he's a trillionaire or something. I said, and and we'll take the story idea of these, this crew that basically transports consciousness around the galaxy and their adventures. That's really neat. Uh, yeah, and, and it was one of those things I came up with the idea and I was like, oh my God, but I don't know anything about consciousness. I was like, <laughs> so, so he, he moved away and over like the last 10 years I've been reading a lot of philosophy. I've been, mm-hmm. you know, watching uh, a, a YouTube channel I found closer to the truth, you know, where they talk a lot about consciousness and biology and all that stuff. So I have, I have, a, um, I had to break it up into three comics and so that's that's one thing I want to get back to. So I, I'm, I have like a quarter of the of the first draft of the first comic book um, mm-hmm. written. So I want to return to that and finish it. You know, like um, finish the story. Yeah, mm-hmm. all these projects sound really cool, and I'm really excited that you're like working on them. And it's it's great to see just art being made even throughout the pandemic and everything. And yeah, it's. It all sounds really cool. I'm like very enthralled with your work right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like for example, like um, like I say, like when I say uh, keep creating, keep working, like even something like um, I did a project uh, last year. Um, I created a band on paper. I created a whole band, like a, um, a rock band. And um, uh, they're called White Dog in the Snow. And I created a whole arc of their of their um, their discography. So um, right now, I think they're on their sixth album. I have I have a few musician friends, and then I'll t- I'll call them up on the phone. And I'll say, "Hey, White Dog in the Snow has a new album." And I'm like, "What?" And like, and I said, "Yeah." And I said, "It's it's titled um, uh, I forget the name of one of their albums now." Uh, uh, I, I create the I create the album name. I create all the song titles. I create the concept art for their for their album covers. Uh, I even created a um, uh, I even created a, a, a tour that they did a North American tour. I call nice. it the Dog Leg Tour. You know, and then they, they actually created all the cities that they go to. You know, I even created the um, the reviews for their 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 third album. You know, from like rolling stone and all that stuff so it's just like uh, just constantly trying to invent trying to invent trying to create trying to create mm-hmm. it may not necessarily be in the form of a play or a screenplay or a poem or or, or a piece of prose like a short story and just just inventing just creating mm-hmm. you know like, and, uh, and even in that form where i'm inventing a band you know i even thought of like if I had if I had any skills, uh, digital skills, I, I could create like this uh, sort of virtual band, like gorillas, you know, like <laughs> or something like that, you know, where you know, like they'll, they'll be like on Facebook, who's this band, White Dog in the Snow? They're not real, actually. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah. yeah, even just coming off the top of my head, I remember watching TV with my kids, and I said, "How is this for a TV idea?" I said. Uh, it's about a teenage witch, and she's her dad is a is a warlock, and he um, works for a living as a magician, you know, to hide his skills as a warlock. He's like a working magician, like David Copperfield or David Blaine, and his his daughter is sort of like coming of age as a witch, you know. And you get to know like um, his his family and and the, the world of of uh, of being a witch, and and and. Uh, and then I, once in a while, I just kick out this cheesy idea. I'd say, "Oh, I have an idea for an episode." Uh, Uncle Dave comes to visit and stay with them, you know. So it's all this episode of Uncle Dave staying with, you know, Hannah the witch and her and her, and her dad, you know, or something like that. So it's just off the top of my head, you know. And, and my kids would just roll their eyes. And say, That's not bad, you know, or something like that. <laughs> That's mm. awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm noticing the time, so we should wrap up. But uh, thank you so much for coming on today. And thank you for our viewers for watching. Merci, miigwech, gracias. And we'll see you all on the next episode. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for being on.